been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. And if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. Come on, say. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prince and shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Now we've all searched for the light of the day and the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. And we've all run the things we know that just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way. you know he's a chain breaker and we can stand in his love. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love
There's power. There's power that can break up every chain. There's power that can empty out pain. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power, yeah. There's power that can break up every chain. Stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I'm standing in your love, yeah. My fear, my fear doesn't. Stand a chance when I'm standing in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Standing in your love, yeah. Because the name of Jesus is a name above every name. It's above sickness, it's above disease, it's above every situation, every fear, every world situation, every president or would be president is all under the name of Jesus Christ. Can the church say amen? Praise 
of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the Lord.
the fact that we don't share what we know to be true and what we know to be joy and what we know in our own experience you've done for us. Lord, help us just to overflow with, with the excitement of living life your way that we have opportunity to speak into people's lives your truth. Lord, we ask that you tear down the strongholds and that you keep whatever it is, whatever spiritual battle going on in, in our loved one's life, that you would you'd work in such a way, you'd engineer the circumstances where they would be open to hearing the good news about what Jesus has done for us. How you've given your life, Jesus, so we might live. And how you came that we might have abundant, full, meaningful, satisfying lives. Father, the world tells folks lies. It's all about what they can get out of life or what fun there might be. But Father, the most fun, the most joy comes in a right relationship with you and living life the way you designed us to live it. So help us share that with people, Lord. We're here today believing that. We're here today celebrating that. And we want to be here preparing, Lord, to share with people who need to know how great you are, how loving, how merciful, how just, how powerful you are, Almighty God. Use us, Lord, to change the world through your power. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with
rescued me so I could stand and see. I am a child of God. Amen. Amen. We're starting a new sermon series today, The Talk That Transforms. So we're, can you believe that? We're through Daniel, and now we get to go on to the Sermon on the Mount. I heard, I saw you say amen. We were in Daniel a long time. I understand that full well. It was long for me too, so I understand that. And we're looking at Matthew 5 through 7 today as we look at the, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher ever about the greatest topic ever. It's preached by Jesus, and it's on the topic of how to live in the kingdom of God. So we get the kind of introduction today as we look at that. Uh, together. Uh, several years ago, Psychology Today uh, ran a little questionnaire poll as to what it meant to be happy and then how you obtain that happiness. I want you to think about that for just a moment. How would you fill in the blank? Happiness is blank. Happiness is. And there's lots of ways to, to fill that in. It might be uh, your happy, healthy kids that make your life Happy, or it might be your own health, or it might be your financial freedom that you experienced or hope to experience at some point. You, it might be your clear conscience. There's a lot of ways to fill in that blank, but as we think about what it means to be happy, we know, and I've said this many times, that, that Jesus isn't so much concerned with our happiness as He is our holiness, but Jesus is also in the happiness business, and it tells us that in the beginning of this great sermon. Because he keeps saying, blessed are those. Blessed are those. And another way to think about that is, happy are those. It's the same word in the, in the Greek language. Happy are those. And so I'm asking you, are you happy? Are you satisfied? Are you content? Are you fulfilled in your life? Are you come to this point where you're dealing with depression or tiredness or, or whatever keeps you from experience true joy and happiness in life and you need this message to be refreshed and understand what the happy life is all about because it's different than what you think. Jesus isn't interested in just entertaining you and making you smile all the time. The Lord hasn't given us a a carefree life in that way and that's not his primary concern but there is uh, such a soul satisfying life that we are to live as Christians, it, in fact, I think it is the responsibility of every Christian to live such a soul-satisfying life under the loving rule of God that sin won't look good to anybody who looks, who's watching. And they are watching. That's a quote from a guy named Dallas Willard. I believe in that very strongly. That we ought to live such a life that, that people say, hey, I want a life like that. And that doesn't mean we walk around with a sour look on our face all the time like we just ate a pickle and are, are concerned about stuff all the time. We have real concerns in this real world, in this real broken world. But we also know that we've got the peace that passes understanding because we serve the Prince of Peace. We know that we have the joy, joy, joy down in our heart. You want me to sing the song? Down in our heart to stay because of what Jesus has done for us. And so when we think about happiness, it doesn't have to do, and this was what was found out in that Psychology Today survey, it doesn't have to do with prosperity. We knew that already as Christians. And yet, don't you find yourself sucked into the culture? That we think happiness is somehow connected to prosperity. Would you hear the word from First Timothy? Now I want you to turn in, to page eight hundred two in that in that black Bible and in, in Matthew five. We're going to look at that in just a moment. I want you to hear these words from First Timothy, though. First Timothy says this. First Timothy six, beginning with verse eleven. But you, I'm sorry, I'm beginning a little bit. Uh, further in verse 9. But, but people who, belong, who long to be rich fall into temptation. There it is on your screen. And are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. That doesn't sound like the good life to me. That doesn't sound like a happy life to me. For the love 
of money. Would you, would you take note of that? It's not money. Money is indifferent. Money is amoral. That means it doesn't have... It's just neutral. But the love of money... And may I say this? You don't have to have a lot of it to love it. You know that? When money grabs your heart... The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered away from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Not happiness. Sorrows. You hear that? Young people, you hear that? You want a job because of what it pays? Or do you want a job because of what God has gifted you to do and what God has created you to do and He's going to bring that soul satisfaction to your life where sin doesn't look good or where material stuff doesn't look so good. I'm not downgrading that because some of you are very gifted in business and and you are gifted with money and you know how to make more money and I want you to make as much money as you possibly can but figure out how much, how little you can live on and how much you can give away. Because I know this about rich folks, and you've been around enough rich folks to know, rich folks are miserable unless rich folks are generous. The most joyful, happy rich folks I know, and hey, let's face it, we're Americans. Most of us in this room compared to the rest of the world are rich. And we, in our wealth, are most happy, not when we get, but when we give. Would you agree with that in the Christian in life as we experience that together? So uh, happiness doesn't come from prosperity is what I'm saying. And the next thing that that little poll found out is happiness doesn't come from pleasure either. Because we're addicted to pleasure as a culture. It's okay to enjoy things, the blessings of God, but it, it's not okay to be obsessed by the next thing you're going to buy or the next thing trip you're going to take or, or the next whatever it is. It, happiness, real joy doesn't come from stuff. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon, said. Now, you remember Solomon? 700 wives, 300 concubines. Our women on Wednesday night are, are studying kings, and they're, they're studying about the. Can you imagine, men, 700 wives to please? Whoa! 300 concubines? That means he could turn over any morning and say to her, Honey, you're a one in a thousand. You know? That's weird, isn't it? I can't even begin to imagine. Solomon had everything. He was the wisest man. He was the richest man in the, probably the history of the world that we know one individual had. And yet in, in Ecclesiastes 2, he says this, Any, Anything I wanted, I'd take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work. And we've experienced that. A reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I worked so hard to accomplish... It was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. And there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. You can't have it all. Where would you put it? Solomon had it all. And yet, he said it's all vanity. Not worth it. So, can we debunk or the idea that prosperity and pleasure leads to happiness, true happiness that's going to last. Because that's what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. He reverses the values of the world. Can you imagine that from um, just a moment? It's like we, we think we want something, and then we get something, and we realize we don't want something. Anybody ever had that experience? We think we want a certain car, a certain house, and then we have to make the payments on it, on that, and we realize, oh, I don't really need this. Why did I do this? Anybody but me ever do that? So you think about, raise your hand if you've ever felt that way. Okay, I want to know. I, at least there are a few sinners like me in this place, you know. We, and so we we don't always want what we really think we want. And once we re- achieve what we want, it's really not what we want. It's like a, the couple who had been married 30 years. I, this kind of hits close to home next uh, June. Jennifer and I will be married 30 years. They married at 20. She was almost 20 when we married. And they married at 30 years. And so the husband decides he's going to get her something different. He gets her a, 
a bottle with a genie in it. And that genie pops out and says to the wife, you can have anything you want. Just tell me what you want. And she says, well, I've lived with that cheapskate. I learned 30 years. So, so I want a cruise. And he said, poof. And there's some cruise tickets. And then the man, he says, to, turns to the man and says, well, you can have anything you want. Well, I've lived with her for 30 years. I'd like a younger wife. I'd like a wife that's 30 years younger than me. And so he said, poof, and matey, matey. <laughs> we don't always know what we want, do we? We don't even know how to ask for it. And so when we, we think about what makes us happy, we're looking at that very subject today. Happiness is. And it's not an accumulation of a bunch of stuff. And it's not going anywhere we want to go anytime we want to go. And, and it's not what the world says so much is happiness. Let's look at what it is. Would you stand and honor the reading of God's holy word? Jesus has been healing and he's proclaiming the kingdom and he's drawn this huge crowd and he's been casting out demons and then he comes to the, the hillside or the mount and begins to teach them. He teaches the crowds, but he also teaches those who are closest to him, those followers of his. Look, Matthew 5, begin with verse 1. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down, and his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Listen to what the master preacher, master teacher taught them. God blesses those who are poor, and realize their need for Him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are meek or humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Father, oh, teach us from your word. Teach us the recipe that Jesus gave us here for true happiness, for a happy life. Father, we want that. All of us, we just want to be happy. We just want our kids to be happy. But Father, we don't even know what that means. So Jesus, thank you for teaching then and teaching now. And Lord, unless you speak to us about... Our, what this means I have nothing to say I ask you to speak through me in these moments in your holy precious and powerful name we pray Jesus amen you may be seated look at these things I hope you have on I hope you have one of these peachy keen sheets right here on the back of your bulletin there's a little outline we're going to look there's a lot of blanks there we're going to cover those of things together, but we're going to cover those in groups, and we're really looking at the recipe for a happy life that Jesus gives us here, and we're looking at the ingredients, and we can just get a taste for that today. And so the first thing I want you to see is it found in verses 3, 4, and 5. Those first three things we're going to cover all together are poverty, grief, and humility, because the first element of true happiness is an upward ingredient sort of thing. You got to have a right relationship with with God through Jesus if you're going to experience eternal forever sort of happiness. And so that begins by understanding what it means to be 
poor in spirit. There's another way of looking at that that I want you to see. Because when we think of poverty, we think that's something that we want to avoid. But when Jesus speaks of poverty, He says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is theirs, He said. You want to know how to get in? Then you got to understand your poverty. How spiritually desperate and bankrupt you are. And I am. When we think about poverty, don't we think in terms of powerless, helpless, homeless, hopeless? When we think about poverty and our, our spiritual condition, we think about how unwanted, unworthy, unclean, unhappy we might be. So when we look at this whole idea, someone has said we've got to understand that in order to be happy or blessed, that Jesus describes that in here, we've got to come to God with an empty hand. When we come to God with empty hands, He fills them with Himself. But when we come to Him, and this is the reason it's so hard for the rich to to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about that as well. Here's why. Because they don't recognize their need. When we come to God with full hands, there's no room for Him. So we come with this spiritual bankruptcy. It's what the alcoholic calls rock bottom. You got to understand when you hit rock bottom, when you when you know you can't make it without Jesus, you're right where Jesus wants you to be because He doesn't help those who help themselves. That's from Ben Franklin, and poor Richard's almanac. That's not in the Bible. God helps those who depend on Him and understand their poverty. You see what Jesus does here? He rearranges all of this concept of who is really blessed. It's not the rich. It's the poor. And he's not talking about finances. It's not the people who think they have it all or have it all together. It's the people who recognize and realize without Jesus, without a relationship with God, without a, an experience of being born again, they have nothing. Because everything they have is going to pass away with them. But with Him, it lasts forever. That connection, that relationship lasts forever. Some people would say, Christianity is just a crutch to get us through life. I would agree with that to some extent. And Christianity is a crutch that I lean on quite frequently. I hope you do too. But Christianity is more than a crutch. Christianity is a wheelchair. Because we don't recognize how spiritually bankrupt we are at times. That's what the second part of this upward ingredient is all about. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's not talking so much about the loss of a loved one and mourning that way. It's not talking about the uh, happiness that that would bring. It's talking about mourning. He's talking about mourning over your sin, about grieving and repenting over what you have done to the Lord and what that has brought about. Don't you recognize That you and I are so wicked that the sinless Savior, that the, the perfect person, that the moral miracle we know is Jesus Christ, the, the fabulous friend who sticks closer than a brother had to die for us, for our sin. We are so wicked. But we are so loved. 
that he was glad to do it. But for the joy set before him, Hebrews says, he endured the cross. We are so quick to, to glaze over our sin. But we've got to recognize if we're really going to experience the joy of a relationship with Jesus and joy in the kingdom of God, what He has done for us and how undeserving we are of His grace. And when we think about what He has done for us, we've got to understand that He, in His grace, has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. When was the last time you recognized how dirty you are? But how clean Christ has made you. You know, it's like kids when they go out to play. Or when we used to grow out to play, it's like the old old Tide commercials. You know, when Tide gets the dirt out. And that's what, what we look at when we look at the blood of Christ. They're, we're all messy. We're all muddy. We're all grass stained. We, and then we come in and we, we take off all those clothes and we throw them in the washer. And Jesus, through His blood, has washed us white as snow. He takes the stain out. He gives us new life. He gives us a fresh start. But we've got to recognize how dirty and filthy we are without Him so that we come to a a full appreciation of what He has done for us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Oh, Think about it this way. The hymn writer wrote, I come to you. This way, nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross. I cling naked. Come to thee for dress, helpless. Look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. We need His grace. We need His cleansing. And praise God, we have it. I have reflected this week on on just some of the things I've done in in my life. And I, I think about how much I need the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the cleansing of God. And I am so appreciative that it's something that He has done for me because I could never earn or deserve that. But when we think about this ingredient, we think, how sorry have I been? How remorseful, how repentant have I been? Because it doesn't just happen one time. We have to live a life if we're going to experience the life in the kingdom of continual repentance and continual cleansing before the Lord. So there's something in your life that you've got to mourn over. Because here's what he says. The next thing is, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. And that's not what we see, is it? That doesn't bring a happy life. When we think about what inherits the earth or who dominates the world, we think about the the achiever. We we think about the type A personality. We think about the the person who is is assertive and the person who is a go-getter and and the person who has these great ambitions. We don't think about the meek. We think the meek are weak. But Jesus describes himself as meek. Remember in Matthew 11, just a few chapters over from what we read, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all you who are, are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. Or I'm gentle, or I am meek. That's another way of looking at that. I, I am lowly in heart and I'll give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light you see he says the meek will inherit the earth you know what meek really means it's not weak it's willing it's people who are willing to submit to a greater authority it's 
the image, it's a word picture of a stallion who is so wild and then gets tamed, gets broken. And his strength and his power is used for the benefit of, of his owner. He is harnessed and he is bridled and now the owner gets the full benefit of the great strength of the stallion. That's the word for meek. It's power under control. That's not how we view it, is it? But that's what Jesus was saying. He had submitted himself to the Father's plan and he called himself meek. He doesn't describe himself with many attributes, but he says that in Matthew 11. And now, as we think about what that means for us, it's not so much of how we get to be meek or how we appear to be meek or it's just a description. All of these things are of what we are in the kingdom. We submit ourselves willingly to the king. And that's the next area I want us to cover. How do we live inwardly once we are part of the kingdom because the way we get into the kingdom is we recognize our need and those are entrance ingredients those first few things those upward relationship now we look inward and as we look inward you see on your outline the next few things we cover are desire and forgiveness and purity blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness blessed are those who are merciful for they will receive mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. So as we think about these next few ingredients to a happy life, we think about things like hunger and thirst. Again, is that a good thing? I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not sure I've ever really been hungry in my life. Or I know I've been thirsty for a period of time, but I mean ever really thirsty because I understand if you're truly hungry, then that's all you can think about. And that's all. If you're truly thirsty in the deepest sense of the word, then that's all you can imagine. But when we think about what he's describing here, he's talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, that you have this mindset, this attitude about you where all you can think about is what God wants you to do. That's your desire. In life, have you come to that point where that's what you want? Where your hunger is satisfied by the bread of life? And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Have you come to the point where you're satisfied, your thirst is quenched by the living water Jesus calls himself? When we, Is that just some kind of religious jargon or talk? Or do you really want what God wants and God wants to give you, the blessedness He has for you in, when you hunger and thirst that way. You have that? There's still room for growth, isn't there? And as I was thinking about where I was in my walk, and, I, and, and as I think about where we're going as a church, I, I thought to myself, Lord, I'm not who I want to be. I'm not who I'm going to be. But I also said, praise God, I'm not who I used to be. There are some things that God has given me victory over. And because He has, I've seen how the kingdom of God works. And I, it causes me to want more of the victory over sin and defeat and impurity and immorality and all the junk, all the stuff that has held me bondage. And I want to experience the freedom that we've sung about. And we don't have to be afraid of of lots of stuff because we have the power of Jesus Christ in our hearts, in our lives. So we talk about these inward qualities. And the next one is simply this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. It's forgiveness. That's so crucial in our understanding of the Christian life that we learn how to forgive one another. And here's what I've, I've noticed about myself. Again, I don't know if you can identify with this or not, but when it comes to folks who have... I have stuff against who have done me wrong, done things that I don't appreciate or whatever they, they might be. You know what I tend to do? I tend to maximize their faults and minimize my own. Anybody? Do you look at the, 
the, the failures of your neighbors or your spouses or your children or your grandchildren and you see what's wrong with them and you fail to see in the mirror what's wrong with you. See, you can't really do a whole lot about what's wrong with them. But through the power of Jesus Christ working through you, you've got the ability to do something about what's wrong with you. So when we extend mercy, extend care, extend forgiveness to other folks, we're reminding ourselves God has been merciful to us. God has forgiven us. God is caring for us. In fact, you can't forgive unless you understand how you've been forgiven. That's why we do forgive. That's why we extend forgiveness, is it not? Because we have been forgiven. We know that, and we know also that forgiveness or unforgiveness damages us much more than the person that we're not forgiving, that we're holding something against. You know, a lot of times they don't even know. It's a, like someone who said um, unforgiveness or bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. It kills us. It kills us when we don't, don't forgive. And I, I wonder, is there somebody that you're maximizing their sin and minimizing your own involvement in it? Isn't it time where you deal with what you can deal with and you ask for God's grace to extend forgiveness to them? Because here's what I know too. If we don't forgive, we won't experience God's forgiveness. I, I want to experience His forgiveness because I know I'm going to need it in the future. I wish it weren't true. I wish it weren't so. I wish I was at the point where I, I was glorified that I'm going to be on the other side of heaven, but... You know, you don't have a perfect preacher. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to appreciate us, but sometimes it's hard to appreciate. I understand those things that go on in our lives. That's the way it is. I understand some of the, the difficulty we have in forgiveness. It's not easy. That's why none of this is easy. That's why Jesus is saying you've got to start with understanding how powerless you are. You need me. You're poor in spirit. Now, the third thing I want you to see in these inward ingredients is just the purity of heart. God's working on us to purify us and cleanse us. And Titus, we'll talk about this in Titus 2. I want you to hear this verse because um, I think it's really powerful. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. I call that costly fun. Yeah, sin is enjoyable for a season, for a time. It wouldn't be tempting if it wasn't. And it wouldn't be sin if it wasn't. And the evil one couldn't use it against us if it wasn't. But there's always a price to pay. And sin always costs us more than we want to pay and and, and keeps us longer than we want to stay. And that's what happens with godless living and sinful pleasures. And the second part of this is we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with this blessed hope. That's the same word Jesus was using in the Sermon on the Mount. The happy hope that we have to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin. And here it is, to cleanse us and make us His very own people. Totally committed to doing good deeds. You know God's in the process of purifying us even now. But it takes cooperation on your part and mine. It takes cooperation to admit we need cleansing. It takes cooperation to put ourselves in a position where we can hear His voice. That's what it, it means when it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, I know in this congregation and throughout our culture that 
Even Christians struggle with all sorts of impurities that come before our eyes that our children are bombarded and not just our children but us on every screen whether it be a smartphone or whether it be a computer. And I know the dangers of lots of junk. Pornography and junk. That's all I'm going to say. I could say stronger words but I'm speaking from the pulpit and I don't want to say any, any stronger words than those at this point. But I know that God wants to cleanse us of that because it robs us of so much in our relationships. With Him first. But with other folks who love us and don't want to see us destroyed. God's in the process of cleansing us. So that we can see Him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, which would you rather see? A bunch of junk or God? God moving and working in your life and the lives of other people around you. You know, my happiest days, the times I feel most blessed are the times when I see God. How long has it been since you said, oh, that was a God thing. That was a God moment. Only God could do that. Only God could heal that. Only God could forgive that. Only God could move in that person's life. Only God could change that person. There's some folks in here that I think you're pretty amazed that God has changed over the years. This is one of those folks. And all of us are trophies of God's grace. But we look at that and we look at the, the last two elements, the outward elements, and blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, are those who are, are persecuted. If you look at that at passage, blessed are the, the peacemakers, for they were called children of God. And it, what, what does that mean? Well, peace is just the right relationship with God. And peacemakers are people who help People have the right relationship with God. And in order to be a peacemaker, we've got to have peace with God. And Re- Romans 5.1 uh, tells us this. Romans 5.1 tells us that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ and what He's done. So, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. He took our place. Not everybody knows that. I hope you know that and know what that means because that's the gospel that He took our place. And we are blessed when we have opportunity to help other people understand that. And then He says something that's crazy about happiness and the source of happiness. And that's where we'll end. Blessed are the persecuted. Those who are are reviled and insulted because of of His name. Now, I think it's pretty crazy that He he said, blessed are those who who mourn earlier. I mean, happy are those who mourn. That's like saying, wealthy are those who are poor or healthy are those who are sick. Happy are those who mourn. It's also crazy to think that He says, blessed are those who are are persecuted, I thought by very definition, persecution means that there's a a lot of pain and suffering going on. And that's true. But he says that makes you happy. How can that be? I don't want to be persecuted. You? Anybody signing up for that? Is that the great church growth campaign we need to come be persecuted with us? You know what he's talking about is that people see Jesus in us to the point where we experience what they did to Jesus. In Acts 4 and 5, his disciples are on mission for him. And they're arrested. And those who arrested them say they were marveled that they were unschooled, ordinary men, but they took note and Acts 4.13, that they had been with Jesus. And after they released him, after they flogged him, in Acts 5.41, they rejoiced because they had been considered worthy 
to suffer for his name. Because they knew they were doing it right when they felt a little persecution. They knew they were taking a stand in an evil, dark world when people were against them. Now, you might be like me or like us. We don't want conflict. But folks, we got it. It's here. Because we are salt and light in a dark, decaying world that doesn't want to be lit up or preserved with the truth of the gospel. We're at odds. How do we do what we need to do? We continue to do what Jesus calls us to do and ex expect we're going to catch some heat for it, but also expect it's worth it and we've got good company because we know we're doing what God's called us to do because that's how they treated people from of old, the prophets of, of, of old, the ancient prophets. When you experience that, don't look at it as a downer. Look at it as, hey, I'm on the right path. If you can, you can't do it without him. You can't look at things like that without him and knowing that he brings the comfort and the joy and the happiness you're looking for. Let's pray together. Father, we know as we give our lives to you, give our lives back to you, that we'll never, ever give more than you've given to us. And Father, we know also that this life in the kingdom is, seems so odd to us because we are so comfortable in this culture. Lord, I just pray that you'll use this time that we are in your word looking at this great sermon to reframe the way we see life and help us see it through your eyes, through a, a biblical worldview and not just the way we think it ought to be. Father, through your spirit and you, through your power, give us what we need to be faithful to the call you've placed on us. Father, I pray right now for the Christians in this place to be on mission with you, Lord, because we know time's short. We don't know how short, but for all of us, in some way, shape, or form, it's short. So help us be about your business. Lord, I pray also for the non-Christian in this place that they'd see how empty and poor, broken they are, bankrupt without you. So Lord, we ask you to be free right now to move in our hearts and that we would respond to you as we sing about your amazing grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Amazing grace. Would you respond as God leads you right now? If you've never come to that point where you've entered the kingdom and you don't know what it's like to live in relationship with God, then today can be your day. If you have, then consider. Consider who is it that needs to make their peace with God. And how can I help? How can I help? Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
for 